Canadian singer-songwriter Neil Young has, you'll forgive the pun, drilled into a well of public opinion that had gone untapped for months. The music icon's critique of the Alberta oil sands and his tour in support of the First Nation that lives downstream from that development have brought the industry and its various players back into the public sphere. Joining us now to discuss the balance between responsible resources, First Nations rights, and the environment, in Calgary, Alberta, Janet Ansley. She's Vice President of Communications at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. And in Regina, Saskatchewan, Ariel Deranger. She is Communications Coordinator for the Athabasca Chippewayan First Nation. And I'm happy to welcome you to our program, you too. And as I start the conversation, we should hear from the guy who got this all started. So let's roll this tape and then we'll come back and chat. Control room, if you would. So I described it as Hiroshima which was basically pretty mellow compared to what was really going on up there. So I, do, I still stand by what I said about Fort Mac and about the way it looks. Janet Ansley, when you heard those remarks the first time, what did you think? I was pretty offended as an Albertan. I thought the comparison of our province and of an important community in our province to Hiroshima was hurtful. It was hurtful to, to me, it was hurtful to a lot of people that I know and that I care about that live and work there. Did you communicate that to Neil Young or any of his people? No, we didn't. You know, he's a rock star, so he's certainly entitled to say whatever he wants. I mean, anyone is entitled to say whatever they want. So a rock star, however, can, you know, has more of a reputation of making these types of uh, hyperbolic statements. And the oil sands aren't pretty. The mining is uh, open face mining. It's uh, not a pretty sight, but over the years, new technologies have been developed. And in, in SEG-D, in situ technologies, the face of the oil sands is changing. And um, we know Neil Young was up there, but he didn't make much effort to, to find out the facts, although he was offered uh, tours and other things. So uh, we took the step yesterday of actually, you know, saying that, you know, at a certain point we have to stop creating more conflict around these issues and actually start looking for solutions. How concerned are you that because of his profile, uh, he will change minds, even if you don't believe his facts or his uh, point of view is accurate. Well, I don't think he's going to change a lot of minds. Uh, the, the people, I think, whose minds are made up on this issue, um, you know, they'll believe. You know, we I think we look for things in our in our world that reinforce our worldview, um, and some people will take Neil Young's statements and cheer them, and others will question them. And I, I'm pretty proud of Canada's media because we've actually seen people do both. And it's the first time I can really observe that Canada's media have gone in and said, well, let's wait a second. Let's look at the statements that this celebrity is making and um, look at their veracity. And so I think, you know, that's the best thing he himself said. It's my job to raise these issues. And I think it's the job of us in society to discuss them. Ariel Deranger, did you find it appropriate to use an analogy to Hiroshima that Neil Young used? Well, you really have to look at it just as what Jan Janet said it was. It was a hyperbole. It was a bold statement, and it was taken from an artist, an artist who's known to make similes and um, hyperboles about numerous different things. And that's what it was. It's what he saw, and it's what he thought it looked like. Now, you can't deny that the wastelands that exist in the open face mining area is quite destructive, as Janet also admitted. But the one thing Janet failed to, to state is that, yes, we have new technologies. Yes, SAG-D and in situ are the new face of the oil sands. But that does not mean that open face mining does not continue and is not going to continue as we look forward in the expansions of Alberta's tar sands. We will see more open pit mines. We will see more uh, tailings ponds, regardless of Directive 74, which said we'd be phasing out of. And uh, so I think that his, his comments were, were warranted in to what he witnessed and saw firsthand. Uh, fair to say he is sort of the face of your campaign right now? You know, he has become a a caveat to begin a really, really important discourse in this country. And it's not to focus solely on the development in Alberta's oil sands, but the treaty rights. The title of these tours is Honour the Treaties, and that's what it all comes down to. Right now, what we're seeing as we have unabated development in Alberta's tar sands is the fact that we're seeing the de facto extinguishment of treaty and Aboriginal rights as we forge forward in the pursuit of economic developments while we bypass constitutional rights. A liberal democracy is based on the highest regard for human interests and the protection of human interests are our rights. 
First Nations and Aboriginal rights are further protected by Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution that protects treaty and Aboriginal rights. And what we're seeing is that those rights are not being protected and preserved when in the face of out-of-control development. Okay, for those who don't know, I gather one of the treaties you feel that is at play here is Treaty 8, which you feel has been abrogated. Tell us first of all what it is and why you feel it has been broken. Treaty 8 was signed in 1899 by, the, by my ancestors in Fort Chipewan. Now this treaty, uh, what it did was it outlined an agreement, a nation-to-nation -nation agreement between the Crown and the First Nations at that time to protect and preserve our rights. Those rights include our ability to continue accessing our traditional territory and lands for hunting, fishing, trapping, gathering, and cultural procurement practices. Basically, until this, as long as the sun shines and the river flows as the interpretations of treaty have gone. Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution was amended to include the further protection of those rights for future generations. And what we're seeing right now in Alberta is that these rights are being, being extinguished, hampered, and um, outright denied with the development of Alberta's oil sands. Janet Ansley, do you feel that you're in abrogation of Treaty 8? Well, rights is the, the, the context we need to put this in because, you know, at the same time, while a, an oil and gas company can purchase a lease, they are purchasing the right to develop that lease. It's a contract that is entered into with the government. And uh, it's like trying to, you know, you purchase a, a piece of land, for example, to, to build a house. And then uh, you later find out uh, that someone else is claiming rights to this land and is saying that if you build a house here, you're going to be violating their rights. Um, so, you know, we have certain social contracts with the government, the First Nations have them with the government, and uh, we as private citizens and as industries and investors have them with the government. So, you know, oil and gas industries and companies didn't sign the treaty with the Treaty 8 First Nations back in um, 1899. It was the, the government um, that, that did that. And uh, what we have to focus on as an industry and what we've tried to focus on over the last 50 years is how to work collaboratively with First Nations to create economic benefits from oil sands development. But the inference somebody could draw from that is that you think you're not in violation of Treaty 8, but you, you almost are saying it may very well be the case that the federal government is, but that's their problem, not really ours. That's what the court has to decide. Okay. Well, you know, Janet, I do want to say that the industry, the oil and gas industry, will be complicit in the breaching of fiduciary obligation by continuing to, you know, right now what we're seeing is there's been a de-evolution of the responsibility to consult and accommodate First Nations to the proponents, the very industries that you, uh, that you basically um, are representing right now. These industries are taking on the obligations and the duties of the government to consult. And that's where we're gonna, you, you're gonna have some serious problems in the future because you are becoming complicit in the violations of treaty and Aboriginal rights, which are held in the highest regard in this country. Janet, do you want to respond well, under, to that? Yes, under Canadian law, the oil and gas companies have a right, as Ariel outlined, to consult and to accommodate. However, what also Canadian law says is that no individual group, uh, firstly, that these, um, that all parties, when they consult, have to be there in terms of uh, meaningful involvement and meaningful participation. Absolutely. And I think there's an excellent track record over the years of, of that having taken place. There's been a number of uh, very meaningful accommodations made for First Nations in the oil sands as well as surrounding other development. And again, our industry has delivered in terms of providing jobs, producing uh, economic benefits, including over $8 billion worth of contracts for Aboriginal and companies. There's 1,700 permanent operating jobs for First Nations making the oil sands industry the single largest private sector employer of Aboriginal people in Canada. And, you know, we have to work together to find solutions rather than boil this down to conflict. Industry, First Nations and government have to come to the table and figure this out. Ariel, do you I, dispute any of that? Uh, you know, there, I dispute some of it. I agree with your last comment. You're absolutely right that industry, government and First Nations need to come to the table. But I think industry is merely a stakeholder and First Nations and governments are nation to nations and they're the ones that need to work this out effectively to determine how to move forward. The problem is, is industry has become um, recognized as a, as a key stakeholder and First Nations are merely just another stakeholder in this industry. But we fail to recognize the fact that we sign treaties, which are nation-to-nation -nation agreements. The Canadian Constitution further protects that and states that we have more rights than 
the industry should, yet we're sort of trying to sit down and be equals. In addition, you talked about economic, uh, economic advancements for First Nations, employment opportunities, and so on and so forth as a, as a form of accommodation. Well, that does not mitigate the impacts that these projects have on treating Aboriginal rights. That couldn't be even, that isn't more obvious than what we saw with the Jack Pine Mine. It stated that the reclamation is not an, a way to mitigate the impacts to treating Aboriginal rights. Um, the end pit lakes and the different types of accommodations that the industry put forward, Shell had put forward, are not ways to mitigate the impacts to treating Aboriginal rights. In the cases of Jack Pine, they clearly stated there, there was irreversible impacts to the rights and land use rights of the First Nations of, of Treaty 8. Now how can you say and continue to move forward and be a part of a project that is in clear violation of Canadians' constitution and the treaty rights of the people of Treaty 8? I think that question is out there for you, Jen, if you want to respond to it. Well, I, what Ariel said in the first part of that, um, that sort of a bit of a rant was um, that this is a nation to nation discussion and that is you know firmly where we see this discussion and, and its primary need to take place the federal government has the fiduciary responsibility to consult with first nations to settle land claims and to deal with any outstanding treaty issues we as industry do not have the right to say zone lands or ascribe lands as traditional land use areas for first nations um, that assignment is not up to us. As I said earlier, um, our expectation as an industry, and I'm not saying our rights are equal to or better than anybody else's or any other group involved in this discussion. Simply put, that if we uh, purchase a right to develop a, a resource, then it is the expectation of investors, it's the expectation of those companies, that they would be able to put together a project plan, and if they comply with the law, and they consult to First Nations, and they create benefits for Canadians in terms of jobs, tax revenues, and business opportunities, and furthermore, it delivers needed energy, that we need to have the opportunity to do that. Now, how that implies, I'm not you know, knowledgeable enough, and it hasn't been uh, outlined specifically as to what um, specific treaty violations um, that on traditional land use or um, specific areas that the industry has been asked to, to address. But until we all sit down and talk about this, but doing it via a rock concert is um, not what we feel is the constructive option. Okay, well we're not at a rock concert here, we're actually on a, on a current affairs television program, so we're, we'll, we'll talk a little more in this context. You, you've both brought up the issue of the economic benefits of the oil sands and I want to pick up on that by reading something that's on the government of Alberta website and then I'll get each of you to comment on it. Uh, it says this, the Conference Board of Canada estimates that every billion dollars of oil sands related investment over the next 25 years will support 1,200 person years of employment outside of the province of Alberta. The largest effects are in Ontario where nearly 600 person years of employment are supported. Over 25 years, employment in the oil sands is expected to grow from 75,000 jobs in 2010 to 905,000 jobs in 2035, with 126,000 of those being sourced in provinces outside Alberta. About 10% of the oil sands workforce is Aboriginal. In 2011, the value of contracts between oil sands companies and Aboriginal companies was over a billion dollars. Uh, Ariel, do you appreciate how vital the oil sands are, apparently not just to the economy of Canada in general, but to Indigenous Canadians in particular? You know, absolutely. I'm not sitting here denying the economic benefits of the oil sands. What I'm saying is that the economic gains that we can benefit from the oil sands are blinding our governments to continue to overrun and overhaul the treaty rights and the Consti Canadian constitution in this country to continue unabated expansion of Alberta's oil sands in the pursuits of economic gain. But if that's the case, I your problem really isn't with, I should ask, I shouldn't say, I I is your problem really more with the federal government then as opposed to the oil and gas industry since that's the nation to nation relationship? You know, yes. The, the, the issue here is that the oil and gas industry just so happens to be at the heart of our conflict with the federal government. Uh, absolutely, our major conflict is with the fact that the federal government is failing to uphold their fiduciary obligation to protect treaty and Aboriginal rights in this country in the face of economic pursuits with the oil and gas sector. Okay. Janet, did you want to comment on those numbers? 
Yeah, I think the the numbers speak for themselves. I would just say, you know, that's what our industry is 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 there to do. It's to deliver needed energy, and it's to deliver jobs and other economic benefits at the same time. We need to have adequate and solid social performance, and continue to work on ways to mitigate the environmental impacts. And I think what I hope Ariel and I could agree on is that you know this would get a lot easier, and there would be a lot more solutions on the table if we could resolve these types of treaty issues. Okay, you just mentioned the environment, and I want to bring up some numbers as it relates to the environment. These are now Government of Canada numbers from Canada's sixth national report on climate change from this year. And as we look at the numbers increasing from 2005 to 2011 to 15 to 30, the numbers show that the emissions from the oil sands will almost quadruple from the beginning of that study to the anticipated end of that study in 2030. Uh, Janet, I wonder if you could help us understand what the national environmental impact of a quadruple rise in those numbers portends? Well, I don't know what the environmental impact is because the, uh, today, for example, the global greenhouse gas emission contribution from the oil sands industry is 0.14%. So it's hard to calculate a 0.14% contribution to CO2 emissions into the atmosphere into some kind of straightforward environmental impact. But no doubt, um, you know, as production increases, it's during that time, while emissions have quadrupled, production will essentially quadruple as well. And, you know, as we increase our production in terms of barrels, emissions will increase. And people point out that's a straightforward problem when Canada is trying to reduce emissions by 20% overall. And we see that bust as clearly as anyone. We're trying to encourage governments. We have one in Alberta to create a technology fund. Uh, we pay $15 a ton right now into a technology fund that actually drives technological solutions such as carbon capture and storage and other things. Uh, but we, we need to do much more. And we may need to look at you know, how we reconcile our targets with, with uh, oil sands growth, and most Ari fundamentally. Excuse me. And Ariel, let me ask you about the health effects because I gather your First Nation is about 200 kilometers downstream from the oil sands. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hearing about elevated cancer rates. Are you really able to connect those two dots? There's, the evidence is starting to become more clear that the types of contaminants that the community is seeing in elevated rates is being connected to this industry. Now, evidence has been mounting. Dr. Schindler released some studies about two years ago, well, three years ago now. This is David Schindler looking, from the University of Alberta? Yes, David okay. Schindler looked at the deposits of uh, the emissions, basically, and the particulate matter from the emissions as they settled in the snow and the types of contaminants that existed within the, the snow settlement and how it impacted the, the ecosystems. And they saw that the disbursement went at least a 100 kilometer radius. But what is more alarming for us is the fact that this, these particulate matters and these pollution, pollutants settle in the, in the ecosystems, um, which impact fish embryos and uh, uh, birds and migratory birds that, that rely on fish, fish eggs as, as food. And then it enters into the food chain, which is a big part of our diet in the region. You know, our members rely on fish, uh, waterfowl, and large game. And plants and traditional plants and medicines are regularly used by these members, which are being contaminated and abused by the industry that is upstream from us. Okay, let me in our remaining moments just get both of you to address one more issue. And that is, you know, we here in Ontario are a couple of thousand kilometers away from where all of this is happening. But from a distance, there may be, I suspect, the thinking among the people in Ontario that we don't understand this. There is an obvious economic benefit to everybody involved. There is an obvious environmental imperative that needs to be taken care of here. And there is an obvious potential solution among the government of Canada, the First Nation involved, and industry if they'd all just sit down and figure this out. And I guess the question is, why hasn't that yet happened? This isn't exactly a new story. Ariel, do you want to go first on that? You know, again, I, I already said it once, the economic gains and the pursuit of those economic gains has blinded our governments into actually effectively addressing the issues. For us and for First Nations, we feel that so much more research and work needs to be done to understand the impacts these projects have on our Aboriginal and treaty rights, because that just hasn't been done to date. The Jack Pine Mine Expansion panel report clearly outlined those impacts and the fact that there isn't enough knowledge for that, and yet we're continuing to see approval after approval be pushed through the system. I don't understand why we don't just stop, take a step back before we continue 
moving forward and approving new projects until we effectively address these issues. You're absolutely right, Steve. We need to sit down and address these issues. And frankly, until that happens, I don't think we should see more approvals in Alberta's oil sands. Janet Ansley, why isn't that happening? Um, the same uh, response in many ways as, as Ariel outlined. Actually, we've been um, you know, developing this resource for 50 years. Uh, I think we enjoy as an industry, uh, although there are challenges, I think we've overcome a lot of challenges over the last 50 years and that we'd like to move forward, like to move forward together. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, we need to bring all parties to the table. And there have been mechanisms over the past number of years uh, to bring the parties to the table, the province, the federal government, industry and First Nations in the region. And frankly, they've, they've failed. Uh, so we need to do better. We look at the Douglas Eifred report that came via the federal government and there's some good ideas in there. You know, these relationships, first and foremost, have to be based in trust. And then we also have to look at substantively on how we move forward on a basis of, of solutions. And, you know, it, it's going to take all parties to bring those solutions to the table. And just quickly, I wanted to address um, some of the um, statements that Ariel made about, about health impacts. You know, industry wants to do the best to protect the health of communities uh, downstream from the oil sands, whether they're 10 kilometers or 200 kilometers downstream. And there's no doubt that an industrial uh, development has a smokestack or, uh, you know, puts uh, um, contaminants into uh, a river. What we are, uh, through a $50 million a year monitoring program, trying to assure people is that no limits are being exceeded. That just like here in Calgary, we have uh, sewer runoff that goes into the Bow River. Uh, the dilution effect uh, keeps it within limits so that the next community downstream can take their drinking water from that river as well. And it's very important that we look at this in the context of science. It's not going to be that there's going to be no impacts, whether it's for non-Aboriginal or Aboriginal communities in the, in the oil sands region. It's just that we need to understand those impacts and we need to agree that some impacts are going to happen if we are to re reap the benefits that this resource okay. can bring. I'm afraid that's our time, ladies. I thank you very much for joining us on TVO tonight. Ariel Duranger, the coordinator with the Athabasca Chippewyan First Nation. Janet Ansley, the VP Communications at CAP. Thank you both for joining us tonight here on TVO. Thank, thank you. you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.